Well, good morning. Welcome to Bear Creek Bible Church. I invite you to stand as we worship our mighty and gracious creator together. sending Jesus to pay the redemption price for our every sin and for his willingness to pay our every burden. We ask that your spirit would help us this morning to integrate your scriptures into our hearts and lives so that we be better worshipers and witnesses. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated.
Well, good morning. Welcome to Bear Creek Bible Church. Uh, for those of y'all that uh, you've been with us a while, you're wondering why I'm standing here instead of a few steps to the side with a guitar. Uh, for those of y'all, this is your first time with us. My name is Travis, and I'm the worship pastor here. Our senior pastor, John Salvis, and his wife, Carolyn, are currently on a vacation. They uh, got to make a, a long road trip um, up to go see uh, Mount Rushmore and to see um, the Badlands of South Dakota, from which I understand are much nicer than their name implies. Um, so we'll uh, be praying for them to have a, a wonderfully rejuvenating time and to return to us safely. Uh, we have a few announcements this morning as we get started. Uh, first up um, is that we are doing our signups for our what we call our flock groups, which are our small groups here. Um, if you like details, there is a... Um, very information-rich handout in your bulletin that has it lists all the different groups that we have, who leads them up, uh, what they're studying at the moment, where and how they meet. Um, so that's all going to be kicking back up. If, even if you've been in the same group for 20 years, we would ask that you go ahead and sign up anyway. Um, that way uh, we aren't assuming something incorrectly. That way we give people a chance that if they want to mix things up and try a different group, they've got that opportunity. So um, please do that. Next up, um, Dennis wanted me to let you know about the new Calibrate classes. So these are our adult Sunday school classes. Uh, a new set of them just started this morning, but if you missed them, that's okay. You can start next week. Um, the two classes start in one is uh, Gary Lamont is diving into the Gospels, um, giving us a good preparation for the coming of Messiah as he looks at the Messiah arrives. And it's actually going to start a longer series of classes that are going to walk the way through the New Testament. Uh, Cody Montandon is um, taking this six weeks to look at uh, the Bear Creek Bible Church Statement of Faith. So if you've been curious about what are some things that are um, distinct to our church, um, or at least distinguish us in some ways, it's theologically, that would be a great class for you. Um, let's see. Uh, okay, so next up we've got an announcement about Awana. So it's a, bit, it's a green announcement. Um, so this is our uh, kids' club program that meets on Wednesday nights. Um, it hasn't usually started. It's right with the school year. It's delaying about a month right now because um, everything's delaying a little bit right now. But uh, it's going to be kicking back in gear on September 30th. If you are interested um, in getting things, uh, uh, you know, in getting plugged in with that, we need uh, folks to be able to plug in as leaders. Um, we want kids plugged in as participants. Uh, you can go to the church website, or if you point the... Um, the camera thing on your phone to the little QR code, that should open it up for you like magic. Technology can be great when it's not a headache. Um, so please uh, please sign up on that. Um, next up, also, the, John wants to let you know about the series and acts that we've been doing uh, on Wednesday nights. So that is going to be um, continuing on this Wednesday at 7 p.m. Uh, you can come in person. You can check it out online at home as we'll be live streaming that. Um, it's a, a great time to just enrich you um, in the Word. Um, also, on the other side of the green handout from earlier, um, BCBC Kids, our children's ministry needs you. We still have some openings for different um, volunteer opportunities, and uh, look through these, pray about these. Maybe, maybe you are God's answer to prayer in terms of who needs to be plugged in here. Um, we, uh, we love to see kids come to know Jesus and come to know him better. So uh, pray about how you might help out in fulfilling those different things. Well, with all that said, I'd like to invite you to stand and greet one another in the name of the Lord. Let's continue standing together as we praise the one who has our glory and our hope.
Well, amen. You may be seated. As we continue to worship our God together, I'd like to read from 1 Peter 1. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled but will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. The scripture tells us that God the Father has saved us and is changing us and has secured us for the day when we will be with him in glory, all according to his great mercy. Let's continue to praise him for his great mercy. Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, um, we do thank you for your great mercy. Your great mercy for not giving us the justice that our sins deserve. But uh, we we rejoice that um, Jesus suffered in our place, bore the debt that was ours. We rejoice that he's risen. Um, and because of that, we are sure that faith in him 
does indeed give eternal life. Father, we pray uh, this morning for our mission focus for Slavic and Olya Nazakevich, who serve so faithfully over in Ukraine. Um, we pray that you would continue to, to guard and protect them, but even more than that, that you would just continue to give them faithfulness as they serve in a hard place, um, as they continue to dispense the gospel, as they continue to, to shepherd their church, as they continue to seek to make disciples. Um, pray that you would use them in wonderful and mighty ways. Lord, we pray for our outreach focus for um, some of these guys who seek to use something as simple as tennis and pickleball uh, to forge friendships and then to share the gospel through those. And I, I know in this last season, that's been harder to do than typical. So, Father, we pray that you would give them um, margin and ability to be able to continue to do what they, what they want to do with using this common ground of a sport be able to, to build rapport and, and share um, the good news. Father, we pray for some of our own who are serving in the armed forces. We pray for uh, Andrew and Scott, Charles, Gabriel, and Emmanuel, uh, for these uh, guys who are sticking their necks out for the sake of keeping the rest of us um, with, with the liberties that we enjoy. But Lord, uh, more again than their uh, even safety and, and even they're representing and, and helping uh, secure our, our freedoms. Lord, we pray that in the midst of their service to our country, that they would be even greater service, servants and ambassadors of our King. Um, Father, we pray uh, for those in our congregation who are going through really hard times, um, who are going through physical things that are just um, tearing them up. Lord, we pray for um, folks like Mary, Zoe, Ken, Terry Sue, Don, Terry, Linda, Mark, Carolyn, Carmen, Roger and Jan, Jill, Bill and Mary Lynn, Penny, Chuck, Mona, Daniel, Emily, Chuck, Roger, Sylvia, George, James, and Debbie. We pray that for each of these um, folks that we care an awful lot about who are going through a tough time, Lord, that not only would you... We, we, we would love to see you heal them physically, but even more than that, we pray that you would help them in the midst of this uh, time of, of sometimes even suffering physically, and that you would increase and deepen their faith in you, um, that they would have a comfort and a strength uh, in you that, that would be even better than any physical healing you might give, though we would love to be able to praise you for seeing them overcome those things as well. Father, we pray for uh, women in our congregation who are pregnant, families who are have, want to have children, even those who are wanting to adopt. I uh, pray that you would be with these families and help them. Um, we, you know, I think of a, f- a few ladies in particular who um, are even right on the cusp of almost giving birth. And so pray that you would be with those mamas, you'd be with their little ones, and that uh, you would help that baby to come to full term, um, and that we would, uh, we would get the chance to get to share the gospel with that little one. And what a delight that would be. Um, Father, we also continue to pray for our sister Sarah Klingscales and the passing of her father. Um, pray that you would be her comfort during this time. Lord, be with us as we turn now to your word, and we pray that we would grow from it, that we would be changed by it, and your spirit would be active in our midst um, to help us to better see our Savior Jesus through the word that your spirit inspired. We ask it all in Jesus' strong name. Amen. Well, it is a, it's a joy and it's a privilege to get to uh, preach this morning with you guys. Um, if you have a Bible, I invite you to go ahead and start making your way to the book of Philemon. Um, if you're in a paper Bible, it's in about the last quarter of your New Testament, sandwiched right in between Titus and Hebrews. If you don't have a Bible with you, um, you can probably Google it and find an app real quick or um, get there digitally. And uh, we, um, you know what? It's, it's not the, uh, the way it's contained. It's what's in, in it that's what's important. So, um, as, as you make your way there, I want you to think about, um, has there ever been somebody in your life who has really wronged you, who has just done you wrong? You can probably think of their face pretty quickly, and you can probably have a, you probably have a, a big web of emotions that you feel when you think about that person's name and face. Likewise, can you think of somebody who you realize, looking back, that you wronged? 
you've probably got their face as well, and there's probably a different subset of things that you think about when you think about that person. Maybe you had anger before, maybe you got some shame now. Um, and possibly there's people in your lives that you realize fit both those categories. Folks that you uh, were wronged by and folks who you in return wronged somewhere along the way, and that's a whole different web of things. Well, this morning as we look at the book of Philemon, this is a book that actually deals with some of both of those things. Um, this, uh, we're we're going to try and do all 25 verses of this book uh, as we go through this morning, and we made it through in first service, so so far it hasn't been a bad idea to try and get through that much text. So we'll we'll hope that over the time we have this morning that that'll be okay as well. Um, but we're gonna we're just gonna dive in, and we'll get our context along the way. So we're gonna start out in verse one. It reads Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved brother and fellow worker, and to Aphia, our sister. And to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So we see coming out of the gate right there in verse 1, that this is a letter from Paul. Um, If you know your Bible well, you know Paul as uh, a man who formerly was a Pharisee. Formerly was one who not only didn't follow Jesus, but made it his ambition uh, to, to actually get letters from the chief priests to have Christians uh, arrested and even would hold the coats of people as Christians were stoned to death. This was a guy who wanted nothing to do with the gospel. Um, And yet, when he encountered uh, Jesus, um, there we read it in uh, in Acts, as he encounters Jesus on the the road to um, Damascus, he he was a changed man. He was one who went from a persecutor to being the greatest missionary, arguably, that the church has ever known. Well, here, as he writes this letter, this is probably the most personal letter he writes in the whole New Testament. Um, and he actually doesn't identify himself with the title first most of, of apostle, but rather as a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Now, part of that is because uh, he's going to make an appeal in this letter that he doesn't want it to be something coercive, but he wants it to be an appeal in love. But the other reason he introduces himself as a prisoner of Christ Jesus is because he was quite literally a prisoner at the time he wrote this. This letter was written uh, sometime between about the year 60 and 62 AD when he was in house arrest in Rome. It's actually the same time that he would have written uh, the books of uh, Ephesians, Philippians, and also Colossians. In fact, this letter would have been a companion letter to the book of uh, Colossians that was also delivered to the church there at Colossae. We'll get to that. There's some neat implications there. But here Paul's writing it with Timothy. Um, He calls him Timothy, our brother, which incidentally is the first of three people in this book he's going to identify as brother. Um, But Timothy was uh, was a a younger guy that Paul was pouring into and discipling. And there's a great little, uh, you know, lesson here to be learned that in the Christian life, it's always good to have somebody that you're pouring into. Um, Whether that's somebody who you're simply older than and you can pour into and, you know, share some life experience or whether it's somebody who you're just a little bit farther along in your walk with the Lord and you can pour into spiritually. Um, you know, and, and it doesn't have to be even that you are this you know, um, person who is so wise. It can be that literally you're a chapter ahead. As long as you stay a chapter ahead of somebody, you can disciple them. Um, and I remember just joyfully, in fact, uh, the other day, and literally yesterday, my mom was, so she's in town right now, which is wonderful. Hi, mom. Um, and she had brought me this, um, whenever she comes, she always brings boxes of like my old stuff that she's like, here, I can't throw this away, but maybe you can. So, um, so I'm looking through here and finding um, even things that were uh, things from early years in college. And this one letter in particular that I had written somebody uh, in college to kind of confront them on something. And I'm thinking, I'd been a believer for a year and a half when I wrote this. Um, and I just, I marveled, not at my spiritual growth, I marveled at like, wow, there were men in my life who were discipling me well, because there's no reason the knucklehead 19-year-old should have written the stuff that he wrote in that letter. Um, and so I, I praise God for the folks who poured into me. Um, at any rate, Paul and Timothy here, they're writing to, uh, to a few people. Here, uh, going on in verse 1, it says, To Philemon, our beloved brother and fellow worker. Now, uh, Philemon, he's a guy um, who Paul cared a great deal for. And he, and he identifies him here first most, that he's somebody that he loves, 
And secondly, that he calls him a fellow worker, that he's somebody else who he sees as also pouring his life out in service to the glory of Christ. Now, uh, next he addresses a lady named Aphia, um, who he calls our sister. Now, most people think that Aphia was Philemon's wife, which again, there's a great lesson that uh, for married couples that you really want, and as you, as you continue to grow in your walk with the Lord, that it would be great that if somebody was writing a letter to you, especially about ministry stuff, that they could write it to both of y'all because there's this sense in which y'all are serving the Lord both wholeheartedly together that it only makes sense to address both. Uh, next up, he addresses a guy named Archippus, who he calls our fellow soldier. Archippus is mentioned as well at the end of Paul's letter to the Colossians. Um, in chapter 4, verse 17, he says, Say to Archippus, Take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord, that you may fulfill it. And so some people feel that Archippus was very likely the senior pastor of that local church. Uh, some people think maybe Archippus was, was actually rather Philemon and Aphia's son. I think it's possible he was both. Um, but at any rate, uh, he addresses these three, and then he addresses into the church in your house. Now, <clears throat> that means that Philemon was a guy that was of means enough to where Literally, there was a church that was meeting in his house, which again, there's a great lesson that if God has blessed you with a little bit more than somebody else, think about what does it look like to use that for God's glory? Um, And Philemon was somebody who was doing that. And so Paul says, uh, grace and peace, um, or grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is one of Paul's typical greetings. uh, and, And it's always in this order say grace and peace. He never flips it. And there's a real key reason why. There's no such thing as peace with God unless we first have grace from God. There is no peace with God without grace from God. And the reason, again, as I uh, mentioned in my prayer, as, as we've sung all morning long, is that um, we, we are people who have rebelled against the Lord through our sins. That sin, missing the mark of God's perfection, is committing a crime against the holy sovereign of the universe. And God is a God of justice, and he's a God who deals with stuff. And so either, either we suffer for our sins or somebody else does. And praise the Lord that he gave his son, um, fully God and fully man, to fully suffer in our place on the cross and die for our sins so that now we can have grace, unmerited favor from God through faith in Jesus such that now we can have peace with God. Now, in that verse 3, when he says the word you, it's the plural you, or as we would say here, y'all. But at this point, he he makes a a, a transition where for about the next um, 20 or so verses, he's going to use the singular you, and he's going to be speaking specifically to Philemon. And so he uh, begins in verse 4 to give a bit of praise to this brother, Philemon. Um, He says, I thank God always making mention of you in my prayers because I hear of your love and the faith which you have toward the Lord Jesus Christ and toward all the saints. And I pray that the fellowship of your faith may become effective through the knowledge of every good thing which is in you for Christ's sake. For I've come to have much joy and comfort in your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, brother. So that's actually the second brother we see in this. So, so far he's called Timothy brother. Now he calls Philemon brother. And he says uh, there in verse 4 that he prays for Philemon. Like often, and whenever he does, he thanks God for him. Um, you know what? That, that's what I want to be, the kind of person where if somebody was to pray for me, they, they wouldn't be like, I pray for that guy. But instead that they would be able to say in a positive way, like, I pray for that guy and I'm grateful for that guy. And here's why Paul's grateful for Philemon. Verse 5, because I hear of your love and the faith which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints. So it's not simply that Philemon has this love for the Lord and this faith in Christ and it just stays vertical. But it's something that has so affected him that now it affects the way his horizontal relationships are too. And so, uh, so he's a guy who, because of the love he has for the Lord, also has this love towards all the saints, all these people um, who've come to know and trust and love Jesus. And so Paul's prayer for him then is also that 
that this fellowship, this sharing of his faith would become effective through the knowledge of every good thing which is in him for Christ's sake. So, so he wants this guy who's already doing well, he wants him to grow more. He wants him to continue to, as he grows in his knowledge of all the good that the Lord has put him in, put in him, that, um, that the fellowship or fair, sharing of his faith would become all the more effective and that Christ would receive all the more glory. And he says in verse 7, For I've come to have much joy and comfort in your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, brother. Paul was in a place, being in prison, I've never been in prison, but I, I can only imagine it's not a place of a great deal of joy and comfort. And yet Paul, in that place, came to have much joy and comfort because of the love of this guy um, and the way that he refreshed the hearts of fellow brothers and sisters in Jesus. Now, in verse 8, it starts with the word therefore. And uh, I had guys who poured into me back in college who used to always say, whenever you come across the word therefore, you ask this question every time. What's it there for? And, uh, and the thing is, he's going to have, he's, whatever he's going to say in these following verses is, is founded in some way and is built in some way on what he's said previously. And he's going to have a bit of a plea that he's going to make to Philemon. So he says, therefore, though I have enough confidence in Christ to order you to do what's proper, Yet for love's sake, I rather appeal to you, since I'm such a person as Paul the aged, and now also a prisoner of Christ. I appeal to you for my child, whom I've begotten in my imprisonment, Onesimus. Now, if you've read this book before, you know who Onesimus is. Um you know what the friction was between Onesimus and Philemon. Um, if that's something that's new to you, we'll, we'll get into it in the following verses. But suffice it to say, Philemon was actually already a little bit on edge before we heard this. And the reason being um, is that we can act, we'll, we'll look at it in more depth later, but uh, in Colossians chapter 4, verses 7 through 9, we actually see that the two people who delivered um, Paul's letter to the whole church of Colossae and this letter were two guys, one named Tychicus and the other one was Onesimus. And as Onesimus rolled into town and rolled into this church and they're delivering these letters, Philemon's got to be thinking, what is that guy doing here? Um, the nerve of him showing his face. But but we see, we see first, even before we get to the, the following verses, we see that Onesimus is somebody who Paul says, I've begotten in my imprisonment. And what he means by that is Onesimus is somebody that Paul had recently led to know Jesus. So now we'll see why there's the friction. Paul says in verse 11 that Onesimus was formerly useless to you, but now he's useless both to you and to me. I've sent him back to you in person. That is sending my very heart, whom I wish to keep with me so that on your behalf, he might minister to me in my imprisonment for the gospel? Well, without your consent, I didn't want to do anything so that your goodness would not be in effect by compulsion, but of your own free will. For perhaps he was for this reason separated from you for a while that you'd have him back forever. No longer as a slave, we'll talk about that, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but now how much more to you both in the flesh and in the Lord. So now we have the picture filled out a little bit. That Onesimus was, or I'm sorry, Philemon was, was not only wealthy enough to have a big house, apparently he was also wealthy enough to own at least one slave. And that this slave, Onesimus, whose name incidentally means uh, useful or profitable or beneficial, Um, had run away from him. In fact, had run so far away from him uh, that he had gotten all the way to Rome, which Colossae and Rome are not close. If you look at that on a map, you've got to cross some some Mediterranean to get from one to the other. Um, And then during that time, had somehow 
crossed paths with the Apostle Paul, had come to trust Jesus through Paul's sharing of the gospel with him. And now Paul sent him back to confront, or at least to, uh, to face, um, this interesting issue. Now, we could spend the remainder of our time trying to delineate the nuances between um, the, the institution of slavery as it existed in the Old Testament and how it was not quite the wicked thing that we somehow devised, or at least some of our forefathers devised um, on this side of the pond years later. Um, and then even how it looked in ancient Rome and how that was a little bit different than either of the two and, and all the shades in between. Um, but uh, but suffice to say, it's, it's interesting that while um, Paul, both here and other places of the New Testament, his focus wasn't so much on upending things that were messed up politically, which if it was, he could have written a lot more than he did because as messed up as things are here, I assure you things were worse in ancient Rome. Um, I've never seen one of my brothers and sisters in Christ burned on a stake. Um, I think Paul had. But all I'd say, um, he also recognizes that there's something about this situation that is not God's best. And as he sends Onesimus back, this one whose name is useful, who he says in verse 11, was formerly useless to you, but now is useful to both of us. Who Paul wants to keep there because he recognizes that Onesimus being um, a one who is actually has more freedom at that point than Paul had being in prison could preach the gospel to people that Paul couldn't anymore. Paul still says, no, we're, we're not going to leave this as something that is torn into and, and, and severed in relationship. We're going to deal with this. And so he sends him back to say, you know what? I think God might be sovereign enough in verse 15 to have had him run away from you so that now you'd have him back forever no longer as a slave, but more than that, better than that, as a beloved brother. There's your third brother. He's called Timothy brother, called Philemon brother, and now he calls Onesimus brother. He says, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord? He's, he's your brother in the flesh, Um, at least partly because God has made each and every person his own image. But now he's also your brother because he's been reborn and he's become part of the family. So now Paul continues on um, making a bit of a, a pledge to Onesimus. And as he does so, um, he applies the gospel in some pretty beautiful ways. Verse 17, he says, If you regard me as a partner, accept him as you would me. But if he's wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I'll repay it. Not to mention that you owe me your own, even your own self as well. Yes, brother, let me benefit from you and the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. And having confidence in your obedience, I write to you since I know that you'll do even more than I say. Now, kind of working our way back through this a little bit, and and especially looking at uh, verses 17 through 19, um, we see a little bit more about the relationship between Paul and Philemon. When he says that you owe me your own self as well. Now, what that likely means is that Paul not only was he the one who led Onesimus to come to trust Jesus, but he's likely the one who led Philemon to come to trust Jesus' Savior. Such that when Paul says, if you regard me a partner, do you think Philemon considered the Apostle Paul a partner in the faith? I mean, I think any one of us would. Just going like, wow, there's a guy. There's a guy who sold out for the Lord. There's a guy who has made Jesus known in more places than many of us will ever travel. He did it on foot, mostly. Some by boat, which then like got shipwrecked and then he got to get dragged to shore and then continued sharing Jesus. Um, but yeah, 
Philemon considered him a partner in the Lord. But when, when, you, when, uh, when, when Paul says, accept him as you would me, but if he's wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. He's using some interesting language here. The idea of um, charge that to my account is the idea of impute that to me. Um, the theological idea of imputation is, is applied in a relational way here. So when I say imputation, the idea that, um, that between, that I've mentioned earlier, we, we have a debt against the Lord, right? That our sin puts us in debt to him. Um, and it's a debt that we can't pay. But it's a debt that Jesus paid for us. And because of that, the Lord now accepts us and loves us with the same zeal that he loves his son Jesus. And Paul's applying that here in a, in a relationship of saying, if he's wronged you, you, you put that debt on me. You charge that to me. And you accept him the same way that you would me. Um, what an amazing example of how we should deal with with our relationships. That as we are um, seeking to make Jesus known and, uh, and, and raising up people in the faith and trying to see people reconciled to one another, they just say, you know what, I'll take the hit. Jesus took the hit for me. I can take a hit for anybody else. You know, why not? Um, so you think about, again, even just put it in human terms, when, when Paul says, accept him as you would me, how do you think Philemon accepted Paul? Like if the guy who led him to faith and who has made Jesus known in so many places rolled into town, how do you think he would accept him? He would give him the best. He would give him the best, of, best place to stay, best of his you know, food, um, best hospitality. And, and that's what Paul says he should give to Onesimus. This guy that he used to own, he says, we're going to have the red carpet for him now. Which even just seeing the change in Paul's heart is a big deal because Paul being a Pharisee wouldn't have wanted anything to do with Gentiles. He would have been pretty ethnocentric and now is saying, no, roll out the red carpet for this guy who's not like you, um, who's not like me, but he's our brother in Jesus. Um, and goodness, uh, whatever that gap is between Paul and a guy who was formerly um, a Gentile slave, I assure you the gap between us and our Father in heaven is much wider. And Jesus has bridged that gap for us. So, uh, so in verse 20, Paul again uses, kind of reiterates this brother language saying, yes, brother, let me benefit or let me Onesimus from you in the Lord Refresh my heart in Christ, which that language should sound uh, familiar because back in verse 7, part of the joy and the comfort Paul had was because of the way that the hearts of the saints were refreshed by Philemon. And now Paul's saying, Philemon, what you're doing to everybody else, would, would you do that to me too? In verse 21, he says, having confidence in your obedience, I write to you since I know that you'll do even more than what I say. And you know what? I think Philemon did do even more than what Paul said. Um, I think we have evidence for that, both in Scripture and outside of Scripture. Inside of Scripture, the fact that this is in your Bible, I think bears witness to the fact that Philemon received this and he took it to heart. Right? If he's the guy where this, that owns the place that this church was meeting. If he heard this and said, no, we aren't doing that, Onesimus, get back to work. Y'all, forget what you heard. He would have torn that thing in two instead. I don't know what that reunification looked like, but I know that he believed and agreed with this so much that he was like, you know what? Other churches need to hear this too. So not only are we going to make copies and recirculate the letter that was, just to, our, that was to our church, the book of Colossians, to make some copies of this too and we're going to make sure everybody hears the transforming power of the gospel to relationships 
So that, that's one way within Scripture we know that, that Philemon received this well. But it, church tradition and church history also holds that there was a certain bishop named Onesimus. Which means a guy who's a pastor of pastors. A guy who is, who is over multiple churches. That This guy Onesimus went from being owned by somebody else to being saved under the mystery of Paul to being reunited with the guy who used to own him and now they're brothers in the same congregation to now is a pastor of pastors. So what the gospel is supposed to do it's supposed to transform people so much on the inside that it doesn't just stay inside, but it worked its way out in amazing ways. Um, so going on to th- the next verse. Paul, Paul, here in verse 22, he transitions back from saying the word you, singular, to saying you, plural. Or again, for us Texans, y'all would be a great fitting thing to say. He says that this time also prepare me a lodging for I hope that through y'all's prayers uh, I will be given. So he assumes this church is continuing to pray for him and he longs to be and even expects through their prayers to be reunited with them so he can um, refresh and serve them. And then he gives a few closing words Shout outs here. First from a guy in verse 23 named Epaphras, who he calls my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus. Now, Epaphras is a name that would have been well known in that congregation. While Paul was the guy who originally brought the gospel to that city, Colossae, Epaphras was the guy who then took it and lit the region on fire with it. He was the guy who evangelized most of that area. Um, It'd be like going in some pockets of our own country and, uh, and having said something like, Billy Graham greets you, that people would have, it would have hit him in the heart in a way that that name would have been so dear. Um, and then he says in, uh, in verse 24, as do, uh, next he lists, lists Mark, who is the author of Mark, the gospel of Mark. Um, he's a guy who, it's interesting, who at times in their ministry, Paul and Mark didn't always get along real well. Um, which, goodness, there's a lesson that sometimes in ministry, there's people who rub us wrong a little bit sometimes. And yet, even in the midst of that, with, uh, with Paul and Mark, their ministry was actually multiplied when they had to uh, part ways for a season and yet were also reunited. And that's um, a beautiful thing. So, he mentions a guy named Aristarchus, who um, you're going to get to hear John teach on him in Acts chapter 19 here in a few weeks. Um, It also mentions a guy named Demas. Now Demas here is mentioned as somebody who's lock arms and lock step with Paul in ministering and yet um, at the end of Paul's last letter that he's going to write, his final uh, letter that he writes in 2 Timothy, he mentions Demas as a guy who had deserted him. And sometimes in life, there's folks um, that are so dear to us who turn their backs on us um, and we don't see him again. And and we thought, really, surely that guy or that girl, that that person who seemed to be so sold out and now has just punted. um, You know, as as heartbreaking as it is when that happens, um, there's something almost comforting about seeing that you're not alone in that because it happened to Paul. Um, It happened to somebody who literally wrote scripture. And so if it happened to Paul, we shouldn't be altogether shocked if it happens to us. Um, And we can also be comforted that, you know, when that happens, it's a sting. And yet, if we'll open up our eyes a little bit, we'll see that God has likely put other people in our lives who haven't left. And that's the case with Paul here. He's got a lot of other people who haven't left. In fact, he's got Luke. And Luke is a guy, um, if anybody was faithful alongside the Apostle Paul, it was Luke. Dr. Luke, who, um, while Paul may have written the most books of the New Testament, Luke actually wrote the most text between uh, the gospel that he wrote and then the book of Acts. Nobody wrote more text than Luke, and uh, he acted as well a bit as Paul's personal physician. 
Um, now, he calls these five guys here an interesting title. He calls them my fellow workers, which if you're uh, paying attention, that's the t- second time that that title has come up. Uh, verse 1, he wrote this to Philemon, our beloved brother and fellow worker. So Paul's saying, um, these guys, these fellow workers greet you. Philemon, my fellow worker, for love's sake, will you do what the gospel commends you to do? Now, I mentioned earlier, um, you know, go ahead and, and, and hang a left, because I want you to see this, over to the book of Colossians. In chapter 4, starting in verse 7. Colossians chapter 4, verse 7. Um, I mentioned before that there were two guys, oops, I think I did. Um, sometimes first and second service get jumbled in my brain, so I apologize for that. Um, plus allergies. Have y'all been fighting allergies? Man, they've been terrible these last few days. Anyway, um, I'm buying y'all time to find Colossians 4. So Colossians 4, verse 7. I mentioned earlier that, I think, that there were two guys who delivered this letter. One of them was named Tychicus. The other one is Onesimus. In Colossians 4, 7, Paul writes, As to all my affairs, Tychicus, our beloved brother and faithful servant and fellow bond servant in the Lord, will bring you information. For I've sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know about our circumstances and that, you, that he may encourage your hearts. And with him, Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother who is one of your number. They will inform you about the whole situation here. Now, I love what Paul subtly does here. Notice again the titles that he gives to these two guys. To Tychicus, he calls him our beloved brother, faithful servant, and fellow bondservant. Onesimus, he calls faithful and beloved brother, who's one of your number. For the one guy that they may never have met before, but that maybe they've heard his name as just a faithful guy who, you know, is, uh, is serving and who Paul trusts to send. The language of servant and bondservant. To this guy Onesimus, that the last time they would have seen him in person was likely waiting hand and foot as a slave. Like, in the same house that they're meeting as a church. He does not use language of slave and servant for Onesimus. Rather, reiterates, brother, and he's one of you. He's one of your number. He's part of your church. He's one of you guys. Um, it's beautiful. Now, you may be asking yourself, um, how do we... How do we apply this letter? Because this is, by far, it's the most personal of the letters that Paul wrote in the New Testament. It's uh, elsewhere, Paul is very, very, you know, doctrine-rich and um, didactic in teaching, and here it's mainly just addressing um, an issue. A few ways. Um, First off, if you're somebody who this morning, maybe some of this is new to you, and the, some of the stuff, especially that we've been talking about this morning, um, you know, you're, you're all on board with the idea of people being uh, unified, reunited, but you go, wait a minute, what is this whole thing about re- being reunited with God? Doesn't he just love me because of how wonderful I am? Again, I would, I would turn you back to some of what we talked about earlier in, in Philemon 3, that, that there, there is no peace with God without grace from God. Um, and I would, I would encourage you, I would, I would plead with you um, to be made right with God by trusting Jesus as your Savior. Um, now, if, if you're a brother or sister in Christ who, that that's, that's not news to you, you know, I think not only the example of this letter, but, but even a few words uh, from the companion volume 
Um, If you're already still in Colossians 4, hang a left one more page over to chapter 3. And and remember that the first time this was ever read in, in that church at Colossae, the two guys that were there who had brought it, the guy who was probably reading it was Tychicus, and the guy who was probably standing right next to it was Onesimus. The guy that everybody's wondering, what's he doing here? I don't know which order they read all this in. I don't know if they wrote, read the letter to Philemon first, if they read uh, the, the book of Colossians first. But dropping down into chapter 3, verse 11, talking about this renewal that we have when we trust in Jesus. And he says in verse 11, it's a, it's a renewal in which there's no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, slave and freeman, but Christ is all and in all. What does that do when you see one of the guys that just delivered this from the guy who brought the gospel to your area? I mean, what, that's got to change some things. And so this passage, in fact, continues to encourage us to take this, this vertical knowledge of a renewed relationship with the Lord and to spread it out horizontally in our relationships. As he says, So, as those who've been chosen of God, holy and beloved, there's some things that need to change. Put on a heart of compassion. When you think about the way that you treat people, when you think about your um, just your tone and, and the, the kind of first thing that you go to when you're at odds with somebody, when somebody's thinking differently than you. Is compassion where you start? Um, Paul, writing under the Holy Spirit's inspiration, says that it should be there. Put on a heart of compassion. Put on a heart of kindness. Some people would say, well, I'm just kind of a hard personality because that's just who I am. You can grow. You're allowed to. Like, in fact, I think Scripture encourages you to. If, if your demeanor, you might say, is just like, like a freight train coming through every time, um, it doesn't have to stay that way. Um, it, it shouldn't stay that way. It shouldn't be that I'm just abrasive because that's how God made me. I'm like, well, it may be how he started you off, but he wants to change you into something better. Um, put on a heart of humility. Um, when you think of other people and, and, you, and you read like, yeah, yeah, those, those people need to put on a heart of humility. What that probably means is, I need to put on a heart of humility. If I'm only seeing how other people need to change, that means I need to change. That's true for each of us. Um, put on a heart of gentleness. Put on a heart of patience. Which is parents, that's really hard. <laughs> Kids are little sanctifiers in our lives. They just continue to show us how much we need to grow in that area. Um, and, then he, he, and then he, at verse 13, man, verse 13 eats my lunch every time I read it. He says, verse, bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave so also should you. Just as the Lord forgave, so also should you forgive. What did it cost the Lord to forgive you, to forgive me? It cost the blood of Jesus Christ. It cost the crucifixion and death of Jesus in our place for us to be forgiven. Forgiveness is a sacrificial thing. Um, and so as people who have been forgiven a greater debt than we can imagine, Paul calls us to forgive either other people just in that kind of sacrificial way. And he says in verse 14, Beyond all these things, put on the love, which is the perfect bond of unity. We live in a fractured world that seems to come up with new ways to be fractured and um, ununified on a daily basis. Um, and so, you know, it can sound like sort of a, 
a flippant cliche or pat answer to say that the gospel is the solution to the disunity that we see, but I'll say it because the gospel is absolutely the solution to the disunity that we see. Because when people come to trust Jesus, distinctions fall apart in the most beautiful of ways. Um, and unity is, is not just a superficial thing because it's deeper and richer uh, than anything that this world could try and put a band-aid on. You, you've seen the, the word staring you in the face for the last little while that says kindred up there. There's a reason. Um, while, while we've kind of dulled that word down to say things like somebody's a kindred spirit or that they're like a you know, kindred brothership or whatever, it, a long time ago it used to be that the word kindred would only be used in one of three different types of relationships. You would only use it, first off, for somebody that you were related to either by blood or that you were related to through marriage or that you were related to through adoption. You're related by blood, related by marriage, related by adoption. But in the gospel, we have all three. Um, first, we're related back to God through the royal blood of Jesus that was spilled in our place and that, that flows through our veins. Um, that as, as part of the church, we are called the bride of Christ. And that as we sang earlier in one of these hymns, um, that the spirit of adoption cries out in our hearts, Abba, Father. Family by blood, family by marriage, by adoption. And if that's the way that we're reunited with the Lord, then that also means that's the way we, we are reunited with one another such that we really can authentically call one another brother and sister because we are reunited as family now by the blood of Christ, as the bride of Christ, and as adopted sons and daughters of the Most High. We are kindred of the Lord and we are kindred with one another. And see, not only should that change the way that we are unified with one another, but it should absolutely change the tone of people who... Um, believe differently than us and who are not like us because the thing is we want them to be part of this family too. We don't just want this to be a kindred unity that, is, um, that itself should be a beautiful witness to the world outside. But we want our relationships with people outside to be winsome as well. That they would say, whatever you've got, I want it. Um, that, that we don't just want this to be a kindred group but that as we interact with people who are not yet believers in Jesus, we want them to become part of the family too. We want them to know the saving power of Jesus' blood. We want them to be united as part of the bride, the church. We want to be able to call them brother or sister as well. Um, let me pray for us. Father, we thank you. We thank you that, that though we were once people who were at odds with you, once we had a debt that we could do nothing to pay, that Jesus paid it. That once we ourselves were actually slaves to sin, that once we were as far from you as we could be, and we could do, do nothing to reach back to you, but that you reached down to us your son. We thank you that through Jesus we have grace, unmerited favor that simply by faith in him creates peace with you. So Father, as a, as a reunited people, as a family, um, we pray that you would help us. We pray that you would be, help us to be so united in love and that the divisions that the world continues to manufacture would just not be so present here and that we would so authentically call one another brother and sister that it would be a winsome witness to the world and that they would want to be part of this too. So help us, help us to grow as people who are compassionate, who are kind, who are uh, gentle, who are humble, and yet who at the same time without contradiction are bold in our zeal for the sharing of the gospel because it is the power for salvation and it's the power to change relationships even where 
Um, a once former Pharisee could call a Gentile slave brother and where that Gentile slave could go on to be a bishop. Help us, Lord. Help us to represent Christ like that. We love you. Pray in Jesus' good name. Amen. Well, I invite you to stand as we respond in song. Almighty Father.